They are found in the suttas and the Vinaya. But so not all of them. Some are later and yeah, some are yeah. earlier. So yeah. things like Anatalakana Sutta, like the cardinal suttas are yeah. direct um, teachings from the Buddha. And some of these are kind of pieced together with like um, ideas from the Buddha, but not. I don't think that one's directly in the suttas, is it? I don't I think, think so. I looked it up and found it, but okay. I wrote it up. And some are in the Sutta Nipata, which yeah. is kind of one of the Sutta books, but it's probably later. It's more in verse form, so you can tell from that that it's been later. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the four of the stars for the Q&A, I have one more thing to say. And it's, and should, it's, maybe we should go over time, <laughs> Bante. <laughs> um, this is more important. Mm. Uh, I, um, I, I just want to say... Uh, uh, things are going really well, and I'm really pleased with what's happening. I spoke to so many people, and there are so many people who have gone um, further and longer and deeper, and have so much more uh, experience, and learned so much. And I, it's, I just want to, and and, and many of these kind of the, um, new experience you had. It's because you've been focusing on what we have been trying to teach a lot. And that's get this arising of some beautiful emotions. We try to speak to kind of teach that from the very beginning. And that has given so many of you so many new uh, experiences. And I just want to shortly just describe <laughs> something for you for the rest of this retreat. We still have one full day, uh, which is tomorrow. And then we have Sunday. And I, in, um, well, I was in Australia, they, um, in Europe, I guess, they invented a new type of skis. And all of you in here probably know what it is, something called ran randonni skis. It's a type of skis which you can kind of loosen the, the heel, and then you can use it as like long distance skiing. And then you can fix it, and you can use it as swallow. And... I was up in Tromsø, which is far up north in Norway a few weeks back, and up there there were so many tourists, and they came there for skiing, and they were using these randonnée or randonné skis. So they, they, uh, they put on their skis, and then it walked up this mountain. There were many beautiful mountains there for, for skiing. And on the top, they do some changes on the sheets, and they, they, they go slow downhill. And that's the fun part. Things are, are it's just a joy. I think they, it's like powder skiing or something. I think that's like a nice expression you're using. And it's just fun, and it's downhill, and it's no stress. The problem is going up. That's when you're sweating, that is difficult, I don't want to go up. Can I, let's, you, it's kind of in, you, you, really, you kind of want to hire a helicopter to get you up there, but you have to walk. But if you do that, if you walk up that uh, mountain with the skis, the higher up you go, the less steep it gets. And then when you come up to the top, then it's flat, and it's much less resistance. And then it's downhill. And many of you are now on the top. You've been walking for a few days. There's been a lot of resistance. There are a lot of activity in your, in your mind. And you have to struggle and kind of be patient while your mind has been calming down and while you've been kind of building up joy and going further. And the thing is, that as soon on the top of this mountain, that's where your mind is relatively still and has some joy in it. And from there on, in reality, if you can keep that in your mind, it's downhill all the way into Jhana. From there on, it's just fun. You can fall. And you, <laughs> you kind of spo spoil that downhill trip. But from there on, it's downhill. 
So many of you have come a long way up this mountain. And just know that from now on, it's just fun. But there's a training to keep kind of going downhill, having fun, all the way. Ajahn Brahm had another way of expressing this. It's like if you, if you decide to walk from A to B, and you start walking, and maybe it's hot and it's sunny, and you walk for a few kilometers and you're sweating, and then suddenly there's this, this uh, taxi coming up to you. And the taxi stops and opens the door. Hey, just where are you going? And you say, oh yeah, just come in here. I will take you to this point B. And the only thing you need to do is to go into this taxi and sit down. And this taxi driver will take you the rest of the journey. And this is the same point where your mind is happy and is peaceful. And that is the taxi driver which will take you uh, all the way into deeper and deeper states of meditation. <coughs> so please continue. We have a full day tomorrow. Please continue being silent, meditate as much as you can, be content with whatever, whatever your mind is. It's up and down and up and down. Just be content, be kind, be generous, Try to be happy, be positive, let go, and see how far you can go. Okay? Then we can start. <laughs> <laughs> we go for an hour now. Because okay? I feel bad for these people's questions. I don't know, we'll see what people want. We'll see. <laughs> okay. If decreasing external stimuli is such an important factor to achieve jhanas, is it possible at all for lay people with a very busy schedule and demands to achieve these without retreats, just with daily practice? Hmm, without retreats, does that mean you're not coming back again? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do it without retreats. That's why retreats exist, so you can come back to retreats. And that will give you a much better chance. But however, it's not um, impossible. Even in a lay life, it depends how busy your schedule is. And certainly that makes it more difficult, the more busy it is. But it's not just the amount of external stimuli that comes to the mind. It's what you're doing with that. So if you actually take in some of that stimuli and try to create wholesome ways of relating to it and create wholesome states from that. For example, engaging with people in a really kind way, using um, beautiful speech to encourage them, um, sometimes stepping back from a conversation if you feel it's not going anywhere, or you know, actually guarding your senses a bit when you're going through the streets and all the adverts are screaming at you. You know, you can do that. So there are ways to decrease the external stimuli, but even more important, I would say, is to work skillfully with it. Um, and then if you do carve out some time for meditation, a little bit every day, and uh, try to just relax and just settle into some quiet and enjoy whatever piece is there, then you never know what might happen. Lay people do get into jhanas at the most um, unexpected times, even when they're not particularly experienced meditators. So it's not impossible, but the main thing, the main um, uh, criteria for success in meditation in general is just that continuity, so you don't give up. You know, even if you stop meditating for a few days, you can still come back to it. Don't think you've failed. You can still start again. You can sit for five minutes here, five minutes there, practice loving kindness. When you wake up, when you go to sleep, and you know, and the thing is, even if you don't manage to do that, you can always come back for a retreat. But I do think retreats, unless you've got some kind of superpower skill, um, are an important part of practice and going deeper and learning more about your mind because that's the time when you can actually see what your mind is doing without um, the kind of imposition of too much stimuli to cope with. You can actually see what it's like when all that settles down. And that way we get much more familiar with our basic habit patterns and how to work with some of the deeper emotions, not only difficult ones, but also beautiful ones. 
and gently allow them to guide you into the deep meditations. So, yes, it's possible, but why make it hard? Come to retreats again, I would say. <laughs> Can one meditate forever? <laughs> <laughs> well, with breaks for sleeping, um, eating uh, toilet, etc. If not, how long should breaks be? Can one meditate forever? Well, not, not as you're being, at least. Um, you can meditate a lot. Um, and, and also, just remember that meditation is just a part of this training. Meditation is, is important, and meditation is, a is like a tool. It's a method we use to empower our mind, and then use that mind to develop wisdom. So it, it's kind of the same, but also kind of different. So it's kind of meaningless, meaningless just to meditate forever. <laughs> Um, if not, how long should breaks be? <laughs> uh, maybe it should be long enough for you to develop wisdom. And go to work. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And care for your family. <laughs> go to the toilet. <laughs> What is the name of the monastery in which you ordained in Burma? Was there a strong community of nuns there? Seminaries, it's asking. Well, you don't really have seminaries in, in Burma, but you have eight and ten precept norms. Seminaries are in training for bhikkhuni ordination, so that's not possible in Myanmar, unfortunately. Um, and again, what was the name of this abbot? Okay, this is a very quick question, so I won't go... I'll get another one shortly afterwards. Uh, the name of the monastery is Tepu Toya Damayeta. Uh, there was a strong community of at least four or six nuns usually, depending. Me and my friend were the permanents, and there were a couple of other foreign nuns, one from India, one from Thailand for some time, and there were also quite a few Burmese nuns that were very good meditators, and that were, some of them were like the nieces of my teacher, Sayadu Upanya Jota. But, um, I mean, it's nice to know that, but sadly now Myanmar is pretty much a mess. And it is not really possible to go there. Also, my teacher has left that monastery and started another huge monastery, which is almost like a, a Dhamma village. It's got schools, it's got plantations, it's got monastery accommodation, it's got kuti accommodation up in a very, um, very rural jungle part of the country where there's lots of malaria and foreigners would uh, have to have permits to go. So sorry about that. But um, <laughs> it was... It was really inspiring because my teacher, um, I mean, he told me in my ordination, which was actually taking dependence on him, so it was actually something like a seminary ordination, only it wasn't really leading to full bhikkhuni ordination. Um, but he said, you know, you practice like bhikkhunis, you might not have the full ordination technically, but you practice that way. And he gave us the conditions to do so, more or less. So that was really wonderful and the conditions were incredible, very basic, very uh, physically difficult, challenging, but um, the Dhamma energy was incredibly strong. Yes. Can I take another one? Yeah, yeah. It's a shame that I can't actually recommend anyone to go there, really. <laughs> but it doesn't really quite exist in the same way. Would you mind if or we also record the hmm, something time opening hmm, the lock lunch lunch time opening would it would you prefer okay this isn't really a question either because I don't want a question but uh, I don't mind if you record it Someone wants to record it? I, I guess that's the chant. The lunchtime then. chant, yeah. Alright, alright, okay. Well, <laughs> do that. I, do you want me to? Yeah, we'll have one more. We have time to do it for Alright. You can bring that recorder of yours and then... Alright. Okay. Oh, well, I'm not getting any questions today. <laughs> <laughs>
That's really cute though. <laughs> Can I keep it? Heart belt. Aha! Cool. It's really cute. It's yeah. got a little heart that sticks out in green. It's an eco <laughs> heart. That's really kind. I'm sure that's for both of us. <laughs> but I have covetousness. Covetousness arising. Oh well, I think it's your turn. No, no, no. Um, no? All right. <laughs> I'll keep going until I get one that I like. <laughs> thank you for your guidance. Thank you very much for saying thank you. Monday and today I fell through on my practice, running off to instant gratification and staying non-mindful for half a day. <laughs> staying non-mindful for half a day. Yeah, well, I'm sure there were periods of mindfulness there because you probably wouldn't have been able to actually function without any periods of mindfulness. But it's good that you know what happened. My patience ran out, so to say. Bring back on the wagon now. Am I trying too hard? Not enough self-care and joy? Got any tips? I don't know. Are you trying too hard? I mean, I hope you're not beating yourself up for it. You say the patience ran out. I mean, it's normal that it'll run out from time to time. It may well be that you were pushing. If you're asking the question, it's probable that you were. Sometimes we ask these questions, but we know the answers really. Um, so you're already asking yourself the right questions. And it's always good to try soft, not to try hard. Try soft and softer and softer. Ajahn Brown once said to me, because I told him that I'm very kind and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of compassionate and I know what my qualities are, but patience is like a little bit weak. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to know our strengths and weaknesses, right? So... Probably I'm not quite gentle enough, so I could be more gentle. And I said, you know, sh you know, I'm learning how to be gentle. He said, no, be gentler than gentle. I thought it was really nice. Gentler than gentle. So gentle that your mind and your object doesn't even know you're there. It's not just that you're being something with it, like being gentle to it. It's like you're so gentle you're actually kind of really stepping back. And that's very similar to patience, I think. So, um, yeah, back on the wagon now. I mean, you weren't really off it, you know. It's only half a day, and actually, I'm sure you were mindful of... I mean, you must have been to the loo. Sorry, I don't know why that came to mind. <laughs> it must be Ajahn Brown, because he always has terrible jokes beginning with an S. And I haven't said a single one of those. <laughs> he has a lot of them. And <laughs> it's terrible, really. Anyway... <laughs> But um, I'm just pointing out that there is mindfulness involved in everything we do because we are attentive and we are aware of what we're up to. It's just that we might not be adding enough kindness and that's where mindfulness really gets strong. Mindful, kindness and also being aware of what you're doing and why. So sometimes we have to take a break and we know why we're doing it. So we're doing it with the purpose of maybe relaxing the mind or recharging or you know, learning not to push the mind. So that's okay. So it doesn't matter. Not enough self-care and joy. I don't know if we can ever have too much loving kindness for ourselves. Self-care, don't know. Sometimes that can be akin to uh, self-indulgence. I think I mentioned already about this study that was done on these different aspects of self-compassion that this psychologist Kristen Neff worked out. And one of them was um, self-kindness as opposed to judgment. But the other two were things like um, common humanity as opposed to isolation and um, hmm, mindfulness as opposed to over-identification, something like this. And she found that self-kindness on its own didn't work, even to increase self-kindness, let alone to increase the other two. But the other two, on their own, increased all three. And that's so interesting, because it's not just about being kind to ourselves, it's about having this perspective that we're all in this together, that we do suffer, um, that we have to kind of see things in context. And I think that's really important to understanding the path. Anyway, that's a bit of a kind of diversion to the question probably, but uh, yeah, just try with more loving kindness. It can never hurt. Do you think it is possible to remember a fragment of a previous life if you suddenly, by coincidence, happens to be at the spot where something traumatic happened in your previous life? I think um, um, 
I think that that will, like, being in a place where you lived in the past will make it easier for you to kind of get those memories back. Uh, absolutely. Um, but still, I, um, I think I have to say that for you to remember your previous lives with a like, high quality, it is probably not enough. Uh, for you to really remember high quality what you're doing, you also need a really uh, peaceful mind. Uh, preferably, basically, jhana. Or something up there, close to that kind of stage. Because then your mind, so still and so empowered, there's so little friction, there's so little disturbances, that it, your mind, it, it's... Uh, Ajahn Brahm had this really nice simile of this. When your mind is really still and empowered, your mind is like this really uh, kind dog. You can just tell him to do whatever you want, and he runs off and do it, and comes back with it. He's so obedient, and so kind, and so effective, and so nice at doing that job. So, when, when you have a really peaceful mind, you have a much better capacity to uh, find those memories. And it's actually quite easy to do. It's basically just asking your mind for those memories. And if your mind is calm enough, your mind will just run into somewhere, <laughs> pick it up, and bring it into your mind. That's how it's done. But you need <coughs> this really, really, really calm, peaceful mind. And I mean really peaceful. But, uh, but outside that, it will happen. It will kind of help this process uh, if you're closer to, if you kind of are there, you've been in the past. I will say that. Yes. Could I just add that even though you might be in a place that you somehow remember, like it seems familiar, right? And then you might think, oh, that's because I lived here before, because it feels kind of like I get a deja vu feeling. That isn't really very useful because you're not certain. And past life memories are like 100% certain, like there's no way you're making it up, there's no doubt. And that's the difference between just having feelings about these places or people that you think you've known before and actually knowing it, like as in reliving it. So I think the difference really is the, lack, is the certainty, the certainty that you have and, and the fact that you know that was so-called you, right, this process. And uh, that has an impact, that puts everything in perspective. Can you please share with us what experience with a teacher has been most inspiring or influential in your practice? Bless you for this retreat. Gosh, um, that's really difficult and I've spoken a lot about Ajahn Brahm, so maybe I'll go to a different teacher. Uh, inspiring or influential though? Hmm, I don't know if I can choose one thing. <coughs> Experience with a teacher. Hmm. Okay, I'll give you one from my first teacher, my um, preceptor in Myanmar. So somebody already asked his name. It's Sayado Upanyajata, which means the light of wisdom. Very nice name. And uh, when I first met him, it was really... I already heard about him before I met him, and I thought, this is it. This is my teacher. I've got to go to Burma ASAP. So I managed to go there the following year in my summer holidays from studying Indian medicine uh, because I didn't want to wait and I spent three months in Myanmar at that time and took temporary ordination, that was 2004 because I had to go back and finish my degree unfortunately um, <laughs> so I went there and uh, I'd heard that he had some very deep insight and so this was the first time I was meeting someone and I'm not going to make proclamations about him so the way I'm phrasing it is who I had faith in was a stream winner or something like that, an area. So I had faith in that. 
and I met him and uh, there was something very inspiring about that. It, it, there's a power to those people, there's a, a kindness, there's a... Mm, it's like a sort of loving kindness that looks at you like a kind of really loving grandparent would, kind of <laughs> with this deep concern, but this kind of humour as well, I don't know. It's hard to explain. But they kind of know your potential because they've seen it in themselves. And they're not judging you, they're not um, measuring you in any way, they just want to give you the conditions to practice. So I met him and uh, the first thing I asked him actually, even though I don't think of myself as rule bound at all, was like, have you got a copy of the Vinaya? Because I just wanted to get right into it. So that's the, um, the code of discipline for uh, monks and nuns. I think it was only the one for monks, but it's very similar. Um, but what I started to notice, and I noticed it that time too when I left from that meeting, that about 15 minutes later I got this overwhelming feeling of loving kindness that came over me just out of the blue, travelling in a car, probably to, I don't know, a retreat centre or something, because we were planning when to take the ordination. And um, I looked at my friend and I said, oh my goodness, do you feel something? And she's like, yeah, I feel it too. And we both felt this incredible kind of flow of loving kindness that was clearly not coming from us. We both felt it. And then uh, throughout my practice life with this teacher, I would feel it whenever he was around and sometimes even when he was on his way back from somewhere and we would be sitting in meditation not knowing when he'd returned. And then I remember saying to my friend again, oh, did you feel something around three in the afternoon? Saido's back, isn't he? And she'd be like, yeah, I felt it too. <laughs> and you would feel the metta just, just suffusing you and this was incredibly inspiring it was like you were surrounded by a kind of protective force field that just lifted you up already to this sort of state of piti sukha and a feeling of such deep well-being that the meditation was just you didn't really want to go anywhere so this was one of the really inspiring experiences and it gave me a kind of glimpse as to the power of such beings and that these um breakthroughs to right view, I don't want to call them attainments, you know, but these mm, breakthroughs of enlightenment, how do you say stages, <laughs> um, they're no small thing, they're really no small thing, like someone who's a stream winner is not a normal human being, their, their impact in terms of spreading the Dhamma and helping people on the path is massive, and uh, of course, some of us might be on the path to becoming um, noble beings, hopefully many of us are, but the difference when somebody actually penetrates through to right view is just like, there's just this wellspring of compassion that comes up, and it, that's really inspiring to me. Yeah. Anyway. This is for you. Okay. I'll take another one. In one of the first Q&A sessions, you read a poem someone had submitted in the bowl. Can you share it with all? Actually, I have it here. Um, can you share it with all? Will you share the recording, please? Uh, <laughs> uh, please, placed on Thursday morning. Played, played on Thursday morning. So first, okay, let's reread this uh, poem. I don't know whether I can do it as nice as Chandra did, but let's see here. The peace and happiness inside. I want to catch it, but it's just hide. <laughs> Today <laughs> I had a, a teaching, and now I know you can only find peace and happiness by letting go. <laughs> if you still need to do, to act, Add, kind, uh, add kindness, it will have a huge impact. <laughs> uh, to all of you with an active mind, uh, just remember, be kind. <laughs> Beautiful. And then, uh, can you share it with all? I've done that. Um, I, I kind of know this. We are probably going to kind of publish this or some kind of yeah. web page or something. 
unless the uh, author says no. Will you share the recordings played on Thursday morning? Yes, it will come on this email we will send out after the retreat. Everybody will all kind of sources and links and recordings and blah blah blah. So it's coming. To Venchanda, what other Dhamma talk from Ajahn Brahm is top of your list? The soft mind? <laughs> uh, wise ways to watch? The soft mind? Wise ways to watch? I'm giving you my top five or something. Uh, uh, avidya means delusion. A V I J J A. <laughs> uh, lose your mind also. And there's one more that would be really cool, but that's really deep, about uh, Anicca Anatta and Dukkha, basically. Yeah. Um, Anicca Dukkha Anatta, Anicca Dukkha Anatta, but that is not for the faint-hearted. But it's like, I mean, we've, been, we've been saying stuff here that's quite deep, so none of you have run away, so maybe you're ready for these things. A lot of them are already out on the BSWA podcast, Deeper Dhamma podcast. Yes. It's a good job I made a list, isn't it? I've got quite a lot on that list, but I narrowed it down. <laughs> some thousands of talks. Mm. I don't know if you have some favourite. Um, uh, for me, like, you, you know, I, I lived with him for 14 years. Yeah. So I, I just got a new one every week. <laughs> I, I got new... Like all these teachings we're listening to, it, like uh, like here on Thursday, I got one of those, and more or less the same quality every week, every Wednesday evening. And I was so lucky, or or maybe it's my good karma, because Ajahn Brahm. Most people agree that he has been been going through this kind of uh, <laughs> this time period where he was kind of at his peak, where he gave his absolutely most stunning, beautiful, deep teachings. And that was just the years I was there. <laughs> I oh, but I think the best, well, anyway, it's yeah. a whole thing discussion. You're right, probably. But yeah. I think the best are like the late 90s and early 2000s. Yeah, That's okay. before you, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, but they were really good. To yeah, say, to but say, some so. from around like 2000 plus, 2000 plus until 2015 something. Mm. That was 10, 15 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, he's he's still mm. doing really good teachings, but at those years, that was just incredible. I would say up to about 20, 2011, actually. Yeah. Can a stream with enter be attached to their family and friends? Yes, they can. Um, stream enter still have craving and ill will and attachments and can be uh, sexual active and family it's just that they they kind of they lost their first kind of greed hate and delusion it's kind of reduced but they're not kind of gotten rid of it yet like higher up the anagami and for, for the awakening it's just the first kind of chunk of uh, defilements have kind of disappeared, but there's still a lot of work, and uh, yeah, probably still quite much work to be done. But they have to continue to, to uh, uh, practice. So they uh, can. There was a lot of examples from the time of the Buddha, a lot of stream winners. They have family. Excuse me, I can't understand what you say, stream what? Okay, um, okay, stream enter or stream winning is the title or the name you use for the first stage of awakening. Okay. So then uh, it's the first kind of breakthrough, the first big kind of uh, changes in you towards full awakening. And, and after that breakthrough you can still have, have a family life and you can still uh, uh, live like a quite normal life but you you will not be like everybody else <laughs> um, something has changed which makes you probably you can kind of assume that this person is much more calm and peaceful and he's not that hungry for uh, like sexuality and, and, and 
all kind of uh, entertainment and and he will probably be a really peaceful person. And I think quite often they will end up taking ordination if they if they if they do something like that. Um, All right. Can you elaborate on what you said about seeing things clearly as they are? What does it mean, as they are? Who knows what is as it is? <laughs> the Buddha knows. The Buddha knows. And us to some degree, to the degree that the hindrances are reduced, we can start to see things more clearly, but we're still not usually seeing them completely clearly until probably stream winning and even then you wouldn't be seeing them clearly all the time but you wouldn't have wrong views about things you wouldn't take anything to be a self you wouldn't take anything to be permanent happiness um, so that would be the main difference so they would see things more in line with reality and I think you know really it's just the fact that you would have no doubt at all about what you're seeing that would make it clear that you were seeing things as they are if there's any doubt um, we still have to do some work. So if we're not sure, then we're not seeing things clearly because doubt is a hindrance that's obscuring our view. So, but it's still, you know, like I said also yesterday, it's a working hypothesis. We have this idea that we should look in the direction of impermanence and not self and uh, investigate suffering because that's what the Buddha's directing us to do. And I mean, we have to assume that he had more wisdom than us, otherwise we wouldn't really be practicing this path, right? We wouldn't be getting anything out of the meditation. These are all methods that he taught. So I don't know if we could have come to this ourselves. Most probably not. So if you're already getting benefit, then there's something in it. And then that will hopefully inspire you to take the next step and the next step. And then you get something out of that, you see the next step. And really, it's like, if things really are, if you are seeing things closer to how they really are, it should also be confirmed by science, I would say. Ajahn Brahm has this lovely phrase, he says, never let your uh, knowledge stand in the way of truth. But he also says something about, um, oh, I forget it now. But it's something about um, science being, mm, that basically if science proves that there's no kind of rebirth, for example, or that there is a self or whatever, then we have to go with that over religion, in a sense. But the fact is, people always say, well, can science prove rebirth? But they can't prove that it doesn't exist. And there's actually heaps and heaps of evidence now that's looking much more, pointing much more clearly towards that it does. So, um, I mean, I'm not saying that we should go by scientific um, values, but what I am saying is it should be something that's a universal truth, like the law of gravity or... I don't know what other laws there are in nature. It's a law of nature that you can see everywhere you look. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, inside here it's impermanent, but in the nature it's not, right? Everything is going to be impermanent in this whole samsara. So, yeah. This is what we're doing this for, to understand what is as they are. What is reality? Is there anything called reality? That's the whole purpose, really, of what we're doing. Even samadhi states, jhana states, are for that purpose, to uncover the truth of the way things really are, and then we can live in line with that truth. I am very grateful for the way you uh, have organized this retreat. Again, it seems revolutionary to run a retreat being led jointly and equally between a nun and a monk. It is actually. It's really good. It's very yeah. rare. It's very precious. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it can be a model for others for the future. Equal, equal and equal and dif differing views being shared together and each of you doing something so inspiring uh, the Bikuni monastery and uh, Buddhist, societies, Buddhist society this is very special 
<laughs> to witness what great what great leads you both ah what great leaders you both are okay. yeah thank you <laughs> so that was just That's somebody really doing nice. verbal I'm happy with what we are doing and I'm actually really happy with what we're doing as well mm. I remember somewhere I don't know if it was here I think it was actually. Somebody said last year, I think it was here, they said after seeing this uh, dual Sangha retreat with Sangha, two dual monks and nuns, they said they, they, want, they think every retreat should be yeah. dual Sangha. Yeah. And there is something really yeah. balanced, isn't yeah. there, about yeah. that and complimentary. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many people. Healing, I think, yeah. for many as well. We got a lot of yeah. feedback about that last year. Mm -hmm. and this, this thing Good. that you can bring in both gender. Yeah and both doing the same thing, coming into this with a little bit of different angle, and there's two different personalities, mm -hmm. just kind of, uh, kind of fills out each other, yeah. somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, it's great, because I mean, as a bikini, I'm very isolated from other Sangha, in England, like there are no other bikinis except if I have a visiting one, but it's not the same because they don't have to actually live there and see how hard it is to get support. And also, most of the monks are very unsupportive. In other words, they have basically decided not to support bikini ordination. So I don't hear anything super negative, but I do hear things like, mm, we don't mind if she's here as long as she's not too close, something like this, and oh, if she's here, then there'll be no one coming to us anymore and crazy things like this. So it's not friendly, it's not friendly. And to meet other um, monastics who are like siblings, basically. We have the same teacher and we're kind of both coming from the early Buddhist suttas and have a probably, hopefully, more um, accessible and kind of relevant way of teaching, I hope. Not to build us up too much, but I think, you know, <laughs> sometimes the teachings can come across as almost suffocated by tradition, you know. And I think... Both of us actually love to meditate and to share the Dharma, and that really helps. So yeah, I, I think this is uh, the way forward for the Sangha, because the Sangha is important. You need people who have devoted their lives to the practice and taken up renunciation and uh, higher training in that sense. And uh, you know, if we can't be relevant and if we're going to perpetuate basically sexist, discriminatory kind of values, then Buddhism won't last very long at all. Yeah, very lucky in Norway. Yes. Do you not get to mix with uh, other Buddhist traditions like the Kadampa who have nuns? Right, well, <laughs> that's a, a whole other thing. But the new Kadampa is a bit of a sect, to be honest. I'm pretty uh, wary of them because they don't take the Buddha as their teacher. They take some other person as their teacher who's who hasn't been seen in the public for... Right, okay, who hasn't been seen in the public. And I think, I mean, the BSWA don't often do this, but somewhere on their page, it might be a Facebook page, they actually say we do not endorse this group. They don't often do that, so I think that group's particularly kind of dodgy. So there's a lot of dodgy in England, unfortunately, and of course, I mean, they might be doing good things at the apparent level, helping people to get, you know, into the meditation as beginners, but I think to join them for longer, you start being asked to sort of give over too much of your, I don't know, money or other things, yeah. So I am a bit selective as to who I associate with. Um, I do have Buddhist friends, but as a monastic, you need monastic friends because it's a very specific path you're taking and it's hard for others to understand quite what is involved there. So it's, I mean, it's like we leave our families, right, our worldly families, and we join our Sangha family. It's a family. Ajahn Brahm's the father, or the grandfather for some people these days. Um, and, you know, then there's the brothers and sisters, and, <laughs> and you have your kind of cousins, and, yeah. So it's like that becomes your refuge, that becomes your community. And um, we have a particular role to play, so, yeah. Um, oh, I don't understand.
Oh, here we go. Starts here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it started work from the bottomless part. I was like, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> when cancelling, Ajahn Chah likened the duty of a monk or non to a bottomless dustbin. Recanted Ajahn Brahm. Was it Ajahn Chah's idea? Was it? Be a dustbin with a bottomless... With a... With, um, a hole in the bottom, basically, yeah, a bottomless dustbin, yeah. I'm sure the part of the dustbin comes naturally when filled with empathy and compassion. <laughs> uh, but how do you prepare or work for the bottomless part? Hmm, is meditating what helps or is it by the force of doing it again and again? How did you get to the bottomless part? I didn't get to the bottomless <laughs> part. I have to be honest. I'm not a bottomless pit. I'm not at all. I mean, yeah, input affects me. It tires me. Even Virgin Ram it does. But uh, I think the skill that he has that he can do pretty well is basically drop it immediately. So even if there are really big conflicts in the monastery that are his business, once he's in his cave, he has the perception that it's not his business and he's not the abbot anymore. So he literally drops things, and I think it's just practice in deep meditation for 50 plus years. I mean, it's going to be his 50th ordination anniversary this year. So that, is it 50th? I think it is. So that means he's been meditating like longer than that. Yeah, he's been meditating like uh, how much longer than that? A lot longer than that, at least another seven years before he ordained. So 57 years, something like this. And the view of non-self helps very much. Um, for me, I guess I try while I'm talking to a person as much as I can to, I mean, I'm a natural empath, so I do feel the other person. I often see I'm using the same body language and, <laughs> you know, it's good, it's nice, it's, you know, I'm sure it helps other people, but I have to be careful to stay in my own kind of energetic field as well and to differentiate between what they're feeling and what I'm feeling in response. So, because some people, especially empaths, they sort of have this idea that they're feeling what the other person feels, but that's impossible. You're feeling what you feel in response. So being clear about that and taking responsibility for that is one way, so staying embodied. And then um, really genuinely wishing them well. And I guess the more I practice, the more I understand that... Um, if a person has, say, a strong emotion, and even if they're directed to me and seem to blame me for it, it <laughs> is actually, well, it happens, um, it is really just a reflection of what they're going through. I mean, of course, there might be something that I can do to help, there might be something that I've done that triggered them in some way that I can apologise for or try to rectify, but in the end we all have to work with our own emotional responses and once I've done my best then I can go away and think okay I've done my best now it's time for me to rest and I think being in a leadership role now and having to see many people every day and write many emails so that's a whole lot of people that must be sometimes 50 60 people in a day and conversations with those people um, you realize that you have to um, uh, find time to rest, but uh, what am I trying to say? Um, you can't prioritise one person above the, above the whole community. So if something gets difficult, you need a boundary because you have to preserve yourself and also the rest of the community over one, say, person who is having problematic behaviour. Um, so that helps me to let go, whereas before I might have thought I have to stick with this until they're through it, you know, and help them at any cost. Now I know I can't do that because I've got this big kind of community. It's kind of international to take care of because they're not all on my doorstep by any means. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really helps. I think I'm still working on that, honestly, because we're affected by one another. But um, I think having some sort of confidence in one's own intentions and integrity really helps. Yeah. What are the blue colors I sometimes see during meditation? They seem to come and go by the breath. When I start thinking, they disappear. Um, this might be, and kind of likely, 
if at least if your mind is getting a bit peaceful and calm and you're having a nice time, um, those blue colors uh, can be very, 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 very early, what the uh, Ajahn Brahm called Nimitas, which is like some kind of reflections of a more beautiful mind, which is kind of coming through, which you can kind of observe in meditation. And in, in the beginning stages of meditation, they, they come and go, because they're not, per, they, they're not kind of, um, your mind isn't kind of peaceful enough and close enough to deep meditation for them to be stable. That comes later on in meditation. That those limiters, those, those signs of uh, a kind of free, brilliant mind, that comes later. So in the beginning, it's natural and it's a really good sign that you are coming down, you're getting more peaceful, and uh, the, uh, I don't know, the energy, the happiness of your mind is taking off. So if you get it, and if, I'm, if, 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 if this is my kind of, if this is a correct interpretation of the, of the uh, question, it's good. It can be blue, it can be white, it can be red, it can be yellow. Um, so, well done. And, and when you stop thinking, they disappear. And that's natural, because then you, the activity level of your mind goes up. You create more disturbances. Your mind getting less peaceful. And then you kind of distance yourself from this joy or this energy deeper inside your mind. Shall we continue? We've nearly finished, love. Yeah. The perception of pleasant or unpleasant sensations leads to grasping or aversion and therefore the sense of self and suffering. What gives rise to the initial judgment of pleasant and unpleasant sensations in the first place? Ha! Huh. Interesting. That's a good question actually. I've often wondered that, like isn't it a judgment to say something is pleasant or unpleasant? And it is. I mean it's perception, right? It's perception. It could be our conditioning, it could be our experience in life, what we kind of vaguely class as pleasant or unpleasant. Some people might say something mildly unpleasant is unpleasant. For someone else that might be relative pleasure because they might otherwise experience chronic pain. Who knows? So it is relative to some extent. But I think um, the point isn't really whether they're, you know, why they we see them as pleasant or unpleasant, but just how we respond. And it's not that pleasant or unpleasant sensations necessarily lead to grasping or aversion. It's just that they are likely to. Especially, well, both really. But unpleasant ones, especially when they seem to suggest the body might be in danger in some way, we're particularly kind of wired to be on the alert. So that's natural because, you know, the brain or whatever else you want to call it, nervous system is programmed to protect the body at any cost. So even a little bit of pain sometimes can create a lot of worry, far more than it really needs, uh, that we really need to be worried about. And that's a kind of survival response. So unfortunately we're wired to be that way. Um, <laughs> so it can pretty easily lead to aversion if we're not aware of it. Um, and the pleasant leads to grasping it has the i think in the suttas it says it has the underlying tendency yeah to clinging to grasping to craving um but again some pleasant sensations are more likely to lead to that for example sensuality or um you're talking about sensations here actually the word is vedana which really means feelings so it's not only bodily sensations it's also um the pleasure any of the sense doors so pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, as well as touches, and also pleasure and unpleasant mental states, pleasure of the mind and unpleasant mind states. Um, so yeah, they are likely to lead to that, especially where there's no mindfulness. So they don't necessarily uh, increase the sense of self. It's more that the sense of self sees them as a problem and clings because we think they belong to us. So we think we own them, and we want to keep them or we want to push them away. And actually, if we're mindful of them, they don't lead to more suffering, they lead to a lessening of suffering. 
because we start to see their impermanent nature, right? And when you're seeing something's changing all the time, it doesn't make any sense. It's not a logical conclusion, but it just doesn't make sense. It's not even possible to grasp. How can you grasp something that's like slipping through your fingers? You know, you can't hold on. It's like sand falling through your hands. So, um, so yeah, we're going to have pleasant and unpleasant and everything in between as human beings or even as animals, I'm sure. But the capacity that we do have, that maybe animals have less of, is the capacity to be aware and to develop the right attitude to these things so that they don't lead to strong aversion and, and craving. But at least seeing that they're leading to that is the first step because then we can start to take responsibility for our craving and aversion instead of blaming someone else who we think has created that sensation in us. We're actually reacting to the sensation. Even just recently somebody wrote to me and they said, oh, they're getting this email from someone they find quite difficult and they said, they just got exasperated and said, I don't like this person. Whenever I read their email I get a headache. And immediately in my mind I thought, what you really mean is you don't like the headache, right? <laughs> and you're blaming the person for the headache. It's actually the, ple the sensations inside, the feelings inside that we're reacting to and not anything outside. So when we can actually be with that and take responsibility and solve the problem there, then it actually lessens the sense of self and it very much lessens suffering. So, yeah. Should we finish off? Yeah. Now it's five past. What do people think? Yeah. 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 Okay. Finish off? Okay. Thumbs up. Okay, let's finish off. Yeah. Uh, three, three more questions. Metanja te bikave chacheto vi mutia. Oh, yeah. Vi mutia is basically this, uh, uh, basic liberation. Cheto is the mind, Bikave is some kind of uh, Abiki, a monk. Metta cha is pro okay, so this problem eating something like the metta yeah. practice makes uh, like a Bikku or a Bikuni, like Bikku or Bikuni's mind uh, liberation, something like that. So doing metta will kind of create uh, liberation in the mind of a Bikku or Bikuni. That's my really rough part of the translation. Yeah, <laughs> and that's right, yeah. yeah. Metta is one of the means towards liberation of the mind, means to jhana. Yeah. 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 He might have been sort of saying, practice it for the liberation of mind, <laughs> probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If my mind wanders during metta practice, how should I regard this with metta? <laughs> oh, this poor little mind. Never mind, mind. May you be happy, may you be well, may you just carry on. Carry on, sending blessings to your mind. Yeah. I don't know. That's it. Make peace with it. And I mean, the thing is with meta practice, I guess the other answer, which is a bit more um, helpful. <laughs> is that the mind will wander, it will wander with the breath, it will wander with loving kindness, and that's usually because we're losing interest in the object. So it's often the case that it wanders if you've only reduced it to some kind of phrase, and the phrase doesn't have any meaning anymore, it's become flat, or it's become repetitive, and you're saying it, this side of your mind, and your other mind's going, ah, yeah, oh, what am I going to have for lunch? <laughs> you know, oh, may I be happy? Oh, no, no, no. So you're not really into it, you're not really feeling it anymore. So I would say reconnect with your body in the first beginning stages, probably with the area of the chest, around the chest, and also with the person you're sending metta to. Um, so kind of bring them up again in your mind, and you can do a bit of um, intentional practice to kind of bring their good qualities to your mind. So the same way we've brought our own good qualities to mind today, you can bring this loved person's good qualities to mind and really get this sense of what you really appreciate about them and how lovely times that you've had together and you imagine them looking relaxed and happy and you feel this connection and you feel it in your heart and then again, you, when you've got that back, then again you can use the phrases and you really imagine that you're giving it to this person and this person's being showered with meta and their face is relaxing, their eyes are twinkling, and it's all very lovely. So then you feel more inclined again. 
And you can also remind yourself that this is a gift for them. So, you know, you just give it as often as you can, as much as you can. Um, you don't put any pressure on yourself. So, yeah, be kind to yourself. Don't expect too much of yourself. Your mind's going to wander until it's, like, really, really... Not wandering anymore. <laughs> until it's really quite stable and the meta's taking off. In my experience, a lot of um, PT can come up even while the mind's still thinking. I don't know. It's not that you have to be completely free from thoughts to start experiencing the metta. And the more that that grows, the more your mind will still. It will become kind of confident and trust in that um, powerful emotion of loving kindness. And at some point it will just like give in. It will just find that more beautiful than the thinking mind. All right. Okay, last question. And if that's not the easy one, <laughs> it's probably a short answer. Is it technical? <laughs> Is it about technology? <laughs> Ajahn Brahm says, there is not one consciousness, but six consciousnesses, yeah. one for each sense. I don't know. Yeah, the Buddha you says. Can, you can say that, but it's probably the Buddha. The Buddha, the Buddha yeah. <laughs> but Ajahn Brahm is saying that as well. What is the difference between the six consciousnesses and awareness? And it, <laughs> is there one awareness and then six consciousnesses? Or one awareness which is the same as mind consciousness or something else? <laughs> <laughs> and this is really, really difficult. But it, uh, like, uh, there is, but at least there's not one awareness. That's not the case. And I, and I think that here we use two different kind of names. One, one is consciousness and then uh, awareness. And then you cannot imply that there's two different things, but it's the same thing. That um, there is consciousness, or there is awareness, uh, but it's not one thing, and it's just a stream of consciousness. It's not that there's just one consciousness which is alive all the time, it's just consciousness of the consciousness of the consciousness, and we perceive it as that we are continuously aware, consciously, uh, continuously conscious. But I think Ajahn Brahm tried to use this, sim this simile to a film. At least uh, a few years back when the film was on, 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 on these tapes. So that you, you look at this movie, which has been projected on a wall, and it seems continuously. as like a continuous process running. But in reality, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of single pictures, which are kind of uh, sent to the wall. And it seems continuous, and it seems that there's all, all the time it's there. But it's a lot of small bits and pieces coming after each other. That's consciousness. So consciousness... Uh, so Mind consciousness, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, well, so consciousness is, yeah. So consciousness or consciousness isn't permanent. It's not kind of everlasting. It's a process running like everything else in a human being. But I don't think we should spend too much time <laughs> in this. It's getting very technical, and it's not that kind of relevant for a retreat. But it's nice to talk a little bit about these, these things. Um, um, Could I add one little more thing? Yes, please. Um, just this idea that there's the six consciousnesses and awareness is the mistake there, because the six consciousnesses include mind consciousness. Yeah. So the six consciousnesses, one of each of the five senses, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness, this is the thing. So they're all separate. They're all separate. And Ajahn Brahm's fruit cellar simile is quite good too, because they're not actually arising simultaneously. We think they are, but because of this process that each one of them is arising and passing every moment, we actually only either see or hear or know through the mind, one moment at a time. So he says it's like a fruit salad. I don't know all the different fruits, but you get the pineapple, then you get the cauliflower, then you get the coconut, then this, then that, and it's all separate. But they go so fast that it seems continuous. So this is the thing. So mind consciousness is what we mean by awareness, or um, what else do they call it? Knowing. Yeah. And you can see the process clearly in meditation. If you have after deep meditation, yeah. after deep meditation is possible. But the mind has to be very empowered. 
yep. and it's not an easy thing to do. But you can start to at least see some impermanence there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, There's a question. Sorry. Are we then training the mind because it's the one sense that we are not experiencing adequately? Or? Yes, in a sense. Yes, in a sense, because it's mixed up with the other senses. Like it comes in after the other senses and it knows that it's seen or heard or whatever. So one of the purposes of jhana meditation is to kind of, if you like, separate mind consciousness from the other five consciousnesses. So you see its nature very clearly. And then when you go back into all the other consciousnesses, it's easier to pick up that particular consciousness. This is what Ajahn Brahm's described in depth to me. This is not what I've seen. Yeah. But this is one of the reasons you take the mind away, if you like, or you empower the mind to be separate from the five senses. And then you see how it creates this sense of continuity because it knows all those different senses, one after the other. So it seems that the whole thing's continuous. Like grains of sand on a beach look continuous. Until you take, I don't know, you get closer, right? you don't need a microscope, but you get closer, and you see they're all separate. Can you, is the analogy of having a canvas with lots of different colours, the colours being the senses and the canvas being what the senses are laid up on? We're trying to remove the colours so that we can be aware of the canvas. The thing is, the canvas isn't permanent either. So Ajahn Brahm has another simile for this of the TV screens. He said, at first, you see all the other senses arising on the screen. You see the colours, you see the movies, and you kind of know that that's all impermanent, right? And then, you know, you turn the programme off once you finish watching it for the night. And then you think that everything stopped, but you still have the TV screen. He says, real impermanence is when the whole TV screen disappears. So that's the mind can also disappear. So yeah, it looks like that at first, but it's not continuous, so it's not really a canvas, it's kind of made up of lots and lots but of... But in meditation we're trying to become aware of the canvas or the TV. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, yeah we're doing this deep meditation to uh, understand this ourselves, how, how, uh, how this works. Yeah, to get a clear canvas, first of all, to get a clear TV screen first. And then bit by bit that fades as well. But as we were talking earlier, we want to emphasise that it only fades into happiness. It just fades into increasing happiness. So, for example, going through the jhanas, you would first start to get less PT and sukha. Like the PT and sukha would be there, the happiness and the rapture would be there. And then they would become even quieter, and then they'd go into like equanimity, and it would just become more and more refined. Yeah. Okay. So, on you that deep note. All the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and some extras. Yeah. Yay! Wonderful. Okay. So. Carry on. Yeah. See you tomorrow. <laughs>